Welcome everyone to today's webinar, How Quorum CBS Specialty Optimize Claims Processing with Automated Analytics. I'm Morgan Hapner with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We're looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log in today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. Brandon Von Kennel is a Senior Manager of Analytics and Automation at Quorum CBS Specialty Infusion Services. Zach White is an analytics advisor at Quorum CBS Specialty Infusion Services. And Andy Day is the Senior Director of Healthcare Solutions and GTM Strategy at Alteryx. At this time, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Andy to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Morgan. This is Andy Day from Alteryx, and I'm very excited uh, to welcome you all to our webinar today, which we hope will be valuable to you. I'm extremely honored and privileged to be joined by Brandon Von Kennel and Zach White from Quorum CBS, who have a very exciting story to share with us in terms of how they are leveraging analytics process automation from uh, Alteryx to, to drive value at Quorum CVS. Quick look at the agenda. We'll take a look at our vision strategy uh, for, for healthcare in the context of analytic process automation. Uh, we'll look at COVID-19 and its implication for healthcare providers and public health. And most importantly, how this is driving, how this is a you know, driver and a catalyst for digital patient engagement in a healthcare context. And then we'll look at this real world examples and stories of innovation from Quorum CVS uh, in terms of how are they leveraging some of these capabilities from Alteryx to drive measurable value. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the Alteryx uh, analytic process automation platform. It's really about bringing together and enabling three areas, right? The first is democratizing and providing access to data from just about any source that you work with. So in a healthcare context, it could be you know, electronic health records, ERP, uh, patient management, revenue cycle management, supply chain management, et cetera. It's the automation of your analytics processes, which are repetitive, time consuming, et cetera, data prep and blending, reporting, et cetera. How do you, how do you automate those processes uh, to drive up productivity and value? And last but not the least, how do you deploy the ease of use to really upskill your people and help them amplify their outputs uh, in an organizational context? The way we accomplish this is with the analytic process automation platform, uh, which is really capturing and automating in inputs and data capture from just about any resource, files, docs, uh, documents, bots, uh, other applications, et cetera, uh, you know, whether on-premise or on the cloud. Uh, obviously blending and, and, and prepping this data to ensure that you can normalize the data, you can, you can cleanse it, you can you know, parse the data out, you can create curated data sets, uh, enrich it with capabilities around geospatial and descriptive analytics. So for instance, if you wanted to understand where are your patient referrals coming from, or if you wanted to establish a new location for testing, uh, how, how, what is the patient proximity to those locations? Uh, that's what these capabilities enable you to do. And then of course, advanced data science capabilities in terms of predictive uh, auto machine learning, code free uh, and code friendly data science, et cetera, which assisted modeling, which helps data scientists leverage predictive and predictive and uh, prescriptive analytics to solve their problems and then automating the outcomes, right? The reporting process uh, via visualization applications, BI applications uh, in, in, in documents or via email. So let's look at this and, and make it relevant from a healthcare context. So the value proposition is captured by the statement here, which is we capture, we help you capture, prep, blend and analyze data from multiple data sources. And we know healthcare abounds in multiple and very heterogeneous data sources ranging from electronic health records uh, to you know, systems for 
uh, human capital management, revenue cycle management, clinical informatics, et cetera, to really enable actionable insights at scale through analytic process automation, i.e. the three capabilities that we talked about for superior business, clinical, and patient outcomes. Now, that's, that's quite a mouthful. Uh, so let's look at it and understand what it means uh, from a healthcare context. But first and foremost, let's look at some of the imp implications of the COVID-19 pandemic for healthcare and public health, right? Really 12 implications we have here, not exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination, but the first three really pertain into tracking the pandemic and its disease outbreak, uh, deploying surveillance, et cetera, which is typically a public health initiative, but in leading healthcare systems are forced, being forced and constrained to bring it within the purview of, of strategic planning. Uh, identifying and securing additional locations and buffer facilities, testing facilities, et cetera, is, is a huge challenge for which, again, predictive analytics, spatial analytics, et cetera, plays a role. Uh, given the staff shortage, recruiting not only retired physicians and nurses, but also those that are about to graduate is a key challenge confronting chief human resource and nursing officers today. Four, five, and six really pertain to uh, you know ad identifying patients at risk. So identifying the most vulnerable patients, otherwise known as you know population health segmentation. Uh, driving, I mean, telehealth, telemedicine has seen a 3,000 plus uh, in percentage increase in usage, uh, given the need to not only keep some of the seniors and vulnerable, you know, patients safe, but also protecting uh, caregivers, etc. And of course, proactively managing employee health, safety, and burnout is top of mind for hospital CEOs. Seven, eight, and nine really pertain to asset utilization and supply chain management. How do you improve your EDOR and observation room utilization patient throughput? In a COVID-19 context, we are literally deploying predictive analytics to help healthcare systems understand how do they redeploy and repurpose their oncology beds uh, for COVID-19, for instance. Predicting demand for drugs, devices, and you know, PPE, et cetera, is a challenge at the best of times. Uh, what COVID-19 did was completely disrupt those existing models, uh, and that is something that hospitals are grappling with even to this day. And last but not the least, in that you know category, if you will, uh, obviously COVID-19 in the surge presents significant unforeseen challenges, but we also have the return of elective procedures pertaining to hip and knee replacements, cataract, cardiovascular diagnostic procedures. So the challenge there uh, for a CEO or a VP of supply chain is how do you balance the supply chain disruption imposed by COVID with business as usual? And then 10, 11, and 12 really pertain to population risk stratification. How do you risk stratify patients based on their comorbidities, et cetera, given the constraint capacity? Improving quality and safety, looking at metrics like county and collapse is a challenge at the best of times now made even more complex with, with the layer of COVID-19 risk uh, you know, imposed upon it. And last but not the least, uh, how do you empower your care coordinators with technologies like remote patient monitoring, predictive analytics, et cetera, to ensure that they can care for these patients once they're discharged? So let's look at some of the typical use cases that we see in a healthcare context. So as we've already talked about this horizontal layer, which is data extraction, from EHRs so to data prep and blending with other healthcare IT systems, predictive and prescriptive analytics and data science initiatives, leveraging some of those advanced auto ML capabilities, natural language processing, et cetera. And given the huge digital transformation underway, which we'll talk about in the next couple of slides, how do you really enable that from a, both an analytics and an artificial intelligence perspective. So looking at some of the core areas or lines of businesses, strategic planning and human capital management, not only understand uh, you know, strategic planning, market analysis, and insights in, in the wake of the pandemic or future uh, you know, epidemics that can hit, but also where do you locate your next healthcare facility, governance, risk, and compliance management, where do you, you know, source the best talent from, manage their performance, uh, manage employee satisfaction, physician burnout, et cetera. Operations assets, procurement, sourcing, and supply chain management is obviously a huge area of value with millions of dollars to be gained, everything from ED and OR utilization from patient throughput management, managing length of stay, 30-day readmissions, strategic sourcing and spend analytics, scorecarding your suppliers, holding them accountable, 
uh, procurement improvement, minimizing managing maverick or off-contract buying, and of course, core supply and inventory forecasting, planning and optimization. Finance and revenue cycle management is obviously core in an industry which roughly makes about 2% net margin. So everything from audit and tax analytics to planning, budgeting, forecasting, cash flow analysis, accounts receivable collections, minimizing denials, patient accounting and risk, and pay for performance and total cost of care analytics. And last but not the least, the fourth box, clinical population health management, value-based care, which is probably the biggest driver of analytics spend and artificial intelligence today. Everything from population health segmentation, risk stratification we've talked about, managing hospital-acquired conditions, quality and safety, all of the metrics around metrics and KPIs and reporting around accountable care organization, population health, performance management, physician scorecarding, care coordination across the continuum of care, which is critical now, especially for high-risk patients, and of course, patient engagement, education, relationship management. So these are all the areas that we see our leading customers deploy Alteryx for, but in addition to which we have built out a partner ecosystem who offer specific package solutions around some of these use cases, and we'd love to talk to you about them. So one of the things that COVID-19 has done is it's literally been a disruptor for healthcare. And it has driven and it has imposed this, this, this three imperatives, if you will, from a healthcare perspective. The first is, how do you drive high quality patients care at scale? especially when you have the incidence of a surge, right, a COVID-19 surge. With that comes number two, how do you deliver that quality of care and protect caregiver health, safety, and lives, right, and do it in a scalable way? And, and last but not the least is despite all of this, despite the fact that, you know, a lot of interactions are not happening face-to-face, -face, uh, how do you improve caregiver efficiency and productivity? So here's a quick look at the patient engagement lifecycle. We have published this as a blog post, which is made available to you via the resources in the webinar. So I've quickly looked at uh, what is this? In, what is this? This is the entire patient engagement lifecycle at a high level. How was this happening before COVID and after the pandemic. So initial patient screening and scheduling, which is almost in person or via phone call, is now being done via the web, apps, chatbot, or phone. Patient data capture, still largely paper-based, but you know, hopefully we'll see this moving to online forms, apps, or chatbots. This is probably where we've seen the biggest change, initial patient physician appointment, which is almost always in person and now almost always is being accomplished uh, through telehealth in appointment to minimize risk for both the patient and the caregiver. Intervention surgeries or procedures, these are still, you know, involve physical intervention, but we increasingly we've seen a huge spate in, in innovation and investment for things like robotic surgeries, given the huge success of the Da Vinci robot system from intuitive surgical and similar technologies. Prescription filling and fulfillment is uh, usually a pain, especially for seniors and those who are locomotion challenged going to the pharmacy. You have models like PillPack, a company that Amazon acquired, which can take all your prescriptions and actually package it by dose and, and send it to your doorstep. Post-discharge care coordination, this was you know, done fairly ad hoc with spreadsheets and, and, and calls. And now we see this huge surge in remote patient monitoring and, and of course the use of underlying you know, predictive analytics, et cetera. And then follow-up scheduling and, and, and appointments, call-in and in-person appointments again is done, is being done via telehealth or remote patient monitoring. And so we see this huge uh, you know, kind of digital transformation you know, happening across healthcare. And of course, underpinning this is uh, the use of you know, de descriptive predictive analytics, artificial intelligence, and even robotics, which is something that I'm, you know, we're, we're just about to publish around. So quick look at some of the AI and analytics enabled use cases. So identifying at-risk patients for adverse health events. We've talked about population health stratification, including risk scoring for co chronic diseases like COPD, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. Uh, projecting the number of total hospital beds you're going to be needing for your ICU and ER and the need to re repurpose some of your existing beds. Uh, predicting demand for telehealth and remote patient monitoring and ensure that you can match the right patient with the right specialist or caregiver. Driving a 360 degree view of the patient for clinicians and nurses at the patient bedside. Uh, identifying and classifying anomalies from automated scanning of x-rays 
MRI and CAT scans using things like machine learning to uh, escalate you know, those patients at risk for the radiologist, minimizing issues with reimbursement and payments, including fall, fraud, waste, and abuse to the use of artificial intelligence, predicting denials, identifying root causes, and managing them to revenue realization. Uh, and then the last two is something we are seeing happening across the world, predictive analytics on cell phone and sentiment analysis to proactively identify disease outbreaks and hot, hot spots of pandemics. Uh, this is happening at a very large scale across countries like China, Thailand, and, and, and Taiwan. And then medical robots were capturing vital signs, like not only temperature for touchless sensing, pressure, glucose levels, as well as for serving food medicine and applying bandages. And we'll shortly see the prevalence of this in a North American context. And with that, I'd like to uh, you know, conclude my presentation showing this quick use case of, uh, you know, of, of health, uh, public health organizations in Ohio really dashboarding, creating, uh, you know, these heat maps of COVID-19 patients to be able to, you know, position and, and uh, deliver resources as needed. And with that, I'd like to uh, transition this to Brandon Von Kennel to talk about a real-life case study on how Quorum CBS is leveraging analytics process automation to deliver measurable value. Brandon, please take it away. Yeah, thanks, Andy, and uh, welcome everyone to the call today. Um, as, as, we met, as Andy mentioned, I'm going to take you through a few different use cases and, and kind of our journey at CVS Health here with, with this tool in, in the arena that I oversee. Um, but I also want to take you through a little bit of, you know, what is our business and what is our strategy in, in using tools like this and, and engaging our leadership and, and, and delivering on our goals? So. Um, from that, I'll, I guess I'll go on to the background, the challenges and the implications of, you know, kind of what we deal with as a, as a specialty healthcare provider. So a little bit about us, um, Quorum, we deliver, you know, high quality infusion therapy services in a home-based setting. Um, you know, what infusion is, for, for those of you that aren't aware, is, you know, delivering of, you know, medication through the bloodstream, through needle or catheter. Um, a lot of our services are performed in home. Um, so we're in our amb ambulatory infusion suites, and what that is is, you know, some people aren't as mobile, or sometimes there's a convenience factor. So it's it's nice to be able to you know go to a patient's home and offer them you know therapies and services in a, in a comfortable setting. From like a volume perspective, you know, on the core side specifically, you know, we service over 200,000 patients a year, um, and we also have branches across the country with these ambulatory infusion suites. Um, for servicing our patient demographic. And, and why that's kind of cool and maybe why it's a little bit unique is that, you know, our patients can be traveling or, you know, there's various reasons why they might need to go um, to get, a, get an infusion somewhere outside their, their home. So we offer you know, services in that, in that area. So the next thing I want to take you through is some of our business challenges and some of the implications of what those challenges are. And, you know, there's a lot on this slide here, but I'll just I'll kind of walk down the left side first. And then I'll go into the right and then just talk about how we how we kind of approach these challenges. So really, you know, for all those of you on the call, if you're part of healthcare, you know healthcare is complex. There's, you know, every business has its own uniqueness. And then within healthcare, you know, we are specialty. So specialty as yet another layer. So what is specialty? Um, specialty healthcare, you know, in this case, you know, usually it refers to the types of drugs that we're servicing, or, you know, our administering to our patients. Um, some of these drugs can be really complex. They can be really expensive. You know, you think of things like growth hormones or chemo or you know, hemophilia drugs, things like that. You know, there's there's special requirements to administer these drugs. You know, it's a lot more complex than maybe a, an Advil for a headache or something like that. So, um, with special drugs come special you know, rules, regulations, administration techniques, monitoring requirements. You know, and, and things like that. So, there's actually a pretty complex process of, of people involved in administering specialty services. Um, you know, nurses, you know, physicians, and all that. So adds another layer to the already complex healthcare landscape. Specifically to our business, we have multiple systems. I think you know, every company has multiple systems. We're no, we're no different. Um, and when you have multiple systems, you know, from an analytics perspective, data perspective, you know, the data is often going to be disparate in nature. And you know, what's in one system may not agree to another, or you might have to you know, have some background knowledge of the system itself to even produce things like data out of the system. Um, system functionality, you know, some of the systems that are, are present in, in our space are maybe a little bit more 
age than others, and you know, with those comes different types of challenges. So in our case, in some of our systems, we have limited workflow capabilities. And what does that mean? It basically means that you know we process you know thousands of claims a day, uh, probably more than that. But how do we prioritize what we work? How do we prioritize how we give work to our staff? It's really that concept. Um, you know, with these you know older systems or age systems, you know transaction processing frequency is, is different. So you know you think about some of the systems that are available today. Um, some have real time solutions. Some don't. So you know you're you're always working within the bounds of your system and how often it can refresh the data or transmit the data to the next person downstream or the next system. Um, then you have bandwidth considerations. You know some systems are are dated and you know they're not as easily upgradable as other systems that are out there. So you always have to consider things like your system's bandwidth when you're when you're you know doing things you know in our landscape. And then just inherent to you know healthcare in general, you know we've always got other complexities when it comes to processing claims. So we've got payers that have different rules and regulations, different processes, different requirements. And then we have different prices for different situations and payers and rules and sources. And then, you know, with, with everything, there's a manual element to our business. We, we have to touch everything that we do. Um, so naturally, there's, there's some opportunity. So taking you through the right side, I just wanted to show a little infographic of trying to make sense of what you see on the left. So, you know, in our case, on the left side there, we have a dis dispensing and billing system, and it has demographic data, pricing data, inventory data, right? And then it has specific claim numbers. On the right side, we have a different system that houses our payment information, our adjustment information, our claim status information, with the same claim number, but slight variations to it. So there's a picture of Zach. He's my, my colleague on the call. He's going to be speaking today, taking you through a little more technical view of some of our stuff. But you know, as an analyst in, in any of the teams that I work on, and we've got a lot of you know, really talented individuals, they have to be thoughtful about the data that they're pulling to make sure it's accurate, complete, and all that. And, and you know, just one, one wrong move can you know, you know, re result in disaster from a data set perspective. So you know, what are the implications? Your data accuracy, quality, timeliness, completeness, that's all impacted. You know, when you have challenging data to work with, you know, that ultimately impacts your data-driven data decision-making capabilities for your leadership. And then, you know, when you're not thoughtful about pulling data, or if you, if you aren't, you know, quite understanding of how the systems work, you potentially risk providing inaccurate data, which ultimately, you know, where I sit, it, it impacts your leadership trust. You know, do we have the trust of leadership that we're pulling the right thing? So we used to, you know, when you think about these things, and I have a little takeaway here, you know, at the bottom, some of the things that our, our leadership has told us for is it's, it's always a tough day to be in analytics, you know, as you as you kind of work through this, because not only do you have to pull the data, sometimes you have to know how it works, and you know, sometimes you have to know the business too. So, what is our strategy as an as an analytics provider to our to our customers, meaning our business teams, which are your like day to day um, claims teams or your leadership teams? So. The way that I approach this with my team and the way that I encourage all, all of us to work, um, from my, my approach is to really partner with the leadership to understand their strategic objectives. Because, you know, we can, you know, with the data, we have unlimited capabilities and with the right tools, we can really bring some awesome insight. So I wanted to walk you through a couple of our leadership's goals and how we address some of those goals. So in, in this case, our leadership's objectives were to elevate financial performance, improve colleague engagement, and unlock data-driven decision-making capabilities. Those are, those are pretty common among you know, a lot of different organizations, um, and they're no different for us. Well, what does that mean, though? I mean, when you get a leadership objective of elevate you know, finance performance. So in our case, it was the first step was really all about establishing performance benchmarks, you know, in, a, in an area where we may, may not had benchmarks or may not have the right benchmarks. So performance benchmarks in this case might be things like Staffing productivity. Um, how many widgets a day do they work? Another area might be to accelerate cash flow. I think that's pretty standard for most companies. They want to you know, improve their cash flow and the time it takes to collect their dollars. And then lastly, you know, how can we detect and resolve revenue leakage? Revenue leakage is, is you know, I don't like that word myself, but it's, it's a concept of, you know, if we're going to bill someone $100, do we collect $100? And if not, why? And can we use advanced data tools to help us figure that out or sort that out or provide the insights to our leadership team to make better business decisions or more informed decisions? The next one, improve colleague engagement. How, how do I take you know, 
tool like Alteryx or some of these other tools that we have and improve the call of engagement. Well, when we, when we work with the leaders of the business, we find that you know, the teams, the staff that are actually working, they would actually would like more performance visibility. They want to see how they're doing. They want to know what they're being graded against so they can be comfortable and confident in their abilities. Uh, you know, we want to reduce manual steps. You know, what are the things in your day that, that really, you know, are non-value add activities that we could help, you know, use tools like Alteryx or any of the other platforms that we'll talk about in reducing the manual nature of some of the work we do. And then lastly, in, in the improved quality engagement is how can we deploy self-service solutions that allow our stakeholders to, you know, be productive or be, you know, able to access their own data insights without waiting for an analytics team to provide those data back to them. You know, if you're able to build the right data and get the data to the people in the right format, they can make a lot of, they can manage their teams more effectively and, and really drive quality in different ways. And the last, the last piece is, you know, unlocking data-driven making capabilities. So you have to evaluate your reporting objectives. So, um, you know, it's really easy to probably, you know, just do ad hoc reporting, but really what do we want to be as an analytics service team? Do we want to, do we want to provide data? Or do we want to try and take that data and make recommendations to our leadership? So we have to evaluate our objectives as we go. Um, we want to. We we took on the approach of embracing innovative tools, you know, things like Alteryx, Tableau, and we'll show some of those here in a minute. Um, because bringing the right tool to the job is, is critical for for any 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 analytics team. And then how can we do all this to really redefine business partnership? And I'll talk about this in a minute. But one of the approaches I take with my team is I I encourage my team to really you know, meet with those stakeholders, understand what they're asking for, and, you know, what, what is the root cause of what we're trying to do? If we, um, if we get a lot of requests for, you know, certain sets of data every month, why do we need that? Like, is there something upstream that's happening that is requiring us to pull that? Maybe we can kind of put on that consultant hat and actually solve some different challenges that might, the business might be experiencing. So the way we, the way we approach on our side is, is really, you know, using this strategy here. I've got up on the screen, I'll, I'll talk through a little bit, but really it's, it's combining the analytics, the automation mindset, and the different areas to, to create what I call the magic, um, kind, of, kind of funny, remember, but um, really it's, it's taking the, on the left side there, the traditional data approach of ad hoc reporting, routine reporting, like we're always gonna have that. We're always gonna have a need to, to produce reports for you know accounting teams, finance teams, really being that operational support. And then, you know, incorporate that finance touch a little bit where we have executive support. You know, leadership has a different view or a different requirement. They need to see performance reporting, P&L reporting. Um, they have to focus on things like forecasting and modeling. Um, so, so taking on that task within. And then this is where it gets a little bit different is we also want to bring in that consultant mindset. You know, how can we improve our processes, you know, through data, you know, whether it's through insight delivery, you know, or, hey, you know, we're seeing this trend push it up to leadership timely so they can they can start taking action or, or implementing tools that allow us to do enable process efficiency, which might be reduction of manual touches. And then lastly, taking that, that little bit of a hybrid role between IT and analytics where, you know, process automation, you know, people that understand the systems, they understand um, the databases, they understand those things and partnering them with the right tools and resources to really create some really awesome solutions. So that's how we approach it. Um, within our space, you know, as like as my strategy to my team, um, and how I push my service delivery to the to the business. So let's talk about the tools for a minute, and this will be important because it'll, it'll kind of relate to the next slide. Is you know, many of our platforms we use, you know, any form. I put Oracle here as an example, but there's many forms of ways to extract the data. Um, as a preparation tool, we use Alteryx. We use it for pretty much everything, and then from an integration perspective. We, we push things from Alteryx into Tableau or Automation Anywhere or Data Robot. Um, and we're just starting some of these more advanced things, but we're, we're kind of in that preparation integration phase as far as you know, what we're working on. So I'm gonna take you through, again, a couple high-level use cases, um, and then Zach's gonna follow up here a little bit later with a more technical view. So you, I wanted to be able to offer, you know, just due to the wide audience on this call, you know, a view from like a leadership engagement perspective and also a more technical engagement perspective. So kind of can offer different insights at different levels. So what I'll do is I'll take you through this, these couple of use cases and just for ease of understanding, the right side here, I've captured the different resources and tools that we use at the existing process and I'll carry the same template going forward. And then I talk about the concern, the impact and the executive risk as well as I'll do a process flow. So 
First, in this case, we're going to be looking at billing work lists. So what is a billing work list? So every day, um, you can see here in the process flow, we have system reports. We have supervisors that manage different teams. Um, they every day would take, you know, tons of claims transactions, we'll call it 100,000 transactions, and build work lists for each of their teams, and they would disseminate those work lists to teams. On average, this would take not a lot of time. It would take, you know, supervisors half an hour each, and if at 40 ballpark, it's about 20 hours a day of work. And that might not seem like a lot, um, but with Alteryx or with other tools, you can really, you can really clean this up, and I'll show you kind of how we approached it. So, what are, what are some of the concerns with this type of process? Well, first of all, the process is manual, right? We've got, we've got leaders touching this um, when they might prefer to be working on more things like managing their team versus prepping workloads. There's complex situational mappings. You know, when I, when I first kicked off my section of the call, I talked about payer complexities, you know, Medicare versus Medicaid, you know, different things like that, that you have to kind of bake into logic. And then, you know, the process that we have now, it doesn't really do any load balancing of widgets. You know, it's, what if one team has, you know, 10 times work of another? How do, you, how do you manage that? So what does that, how does that impact your stakeholders? Well, it's time consuming to create, it delays the kickoff of daily tasks, and it's error prone. Um, so you have staff that could potentially be waiting around. And from an executive perspective, what does that mean to, you know, the highest level leadership team? That means calling downtime, inconsistent productivity, because people may or may not have their work list available. And then it also may make it real challenging for our finance teams and our leadership teams to even create staffing models. So the downstream effect of this can actually go all the way up to the, the highest level. So how do we approach this? Again, to the right, you know, we still work with the business and we bolted in some really advanced tools. I'll walk through the process flow here and I'll talk about the solutions. So what we did is we met with the team and said, hey, um, here's your work list today. What would you like to have in them? And what we were able to define was there is a lot of nice to have data that, that they would like to see in those um, if we could enhance this process. So we take those nice to have data approach, we take the system reports and that business mapping that they were doing every day, all those filters and pivots and all that, and we put it into Alteryx. And the cool thing about this is those business mappings, those are the manual tasks that the supervisor is doing to assign claims to teams. We actually just put that right into the logic of Alteryx and it's easy to pass through. We then capture all that data and we send out these, what I call super work lists to a storage site, whether it's SharePoint or you know, just a shared drive, so that the, the, the staff can actually access them daily. We also send out a, that same data set to a Tableau dashboard, which I'll show you in a minute, um, so that our leadership has visibility to what's out there, what's in the queue. And then we also send out a business email notification through Alteryx, letting the business know that, hey, your work lists are available. So what did this do? Just very simply, you know, we automated the work list, we automated the mapping, we integrated the nice to have data, and we deliver these at the start of the day. And what that allows you to do is, you know, if, if things are reliable and automated and they're delivered at eight o'clock every morning, you can start having, you can start planning your staff's days differently. What does that do to the business? The supervisor able to refocus their time on different efforts and enhance error-free work lists and an elevated staff engagement because they're able to start their days on time, get what they need to their jobs. And then from an executive perspective, it increases productivity, it improves the work quality, and it stabilizes our staff. It gives you know, everyone the same opportunity to, to work their required productivity every day. So this new process takes about three minutes and no one touches it. So just to kind of restate, we took something that was 20 hours a day and turned it into three minutes and they got all this extra stuff with it. So, it was, you know, really impactful for our business. They like it. They've, it's been a tool that we've had in place for approximately two years, and it's just been, been great for our, our leadership team. Now, one of the, I guess, almost unknown benefits that came with it was we were able to take that data and push it in a tableau, and something that they never even had before was visibility on, on some of their work. So we're able to take that data and push it in a tableau. We're able to create trending week over week. You know, with tableau, you're able to extract the data, you can do week over week trending performance. You're able to calculate rollovers, inflows. And basically, if we needed to create more views in Tableau with that same data, it's easy to quickly pivot and, and do all that. So we were able to deliver the leadership team a monitoring solution as well as enhanced workloads for the team. The next one I want to take you through is it's a it's just a it's a spin-off of that same thing. So again, this one's called claim diversion. So in this scenario, we had some of those claims that we're passing to the teams, they have errors on them. And you know, nothing more complex than that. Some claims have errors and we need to fix them. 
well, how do you prioritize an error over the 100,000 other things that you do? Well, what we did here was we didn't, we didn't even have a way to really monitor this before because the baseline reporting was limited and it lacked logic. So the concern was claims with issues are not work timely and that could decrease the quality of, and likelihood of payment. So that creates rework for the staff. Um, it impacts the effectiveness of a touch, meaning if we're redoing rework, we're not actually getting the claim out the door. And then it can create backlogs. To my leadership, that looks like inconsistent productivity, delayed cash flow, and just overall performance impact. So what we did is while we were doing that whole data cleanup process from our, you know, to create those work lists, we were able to bring in that same data and enhance that diversion data that's nice to have, like I mentioned in the last one. We were able to, you know, piggyback off that business mapping that we had and push it on Altrix. And then we were able to interview our executive team and say, hey, what are the leadership SLAs that you want? Like, do you want these claims that are in error work first or last or what? Um, so they, you know, we were able to partner with them and then using the same tools we had before, you know, same process that we already built in Altrix once, we just, you know, copy pasted in the lack of a better word and created another view um, that looks like this. So those claim issues that were out there, we're able to capture them in real time, put them out in a dashboard. We're able to put a leadership SLA on them, some, you know, where there's no policy or anything like that. We're able to create, basically create one and blast out this email every day with this snapshot of this dashboard that says, hey, look, here's all the things that uh, are in, a, in an error status and you have three days left to fix them. So, you know, the power of Altrix in this case was allowing us to create policies and processes and workflow where it didn't exist at all. A uh, couple other quick ones, just talking about visibility. You know, when we look at, you know, payers, we want to be able to see what their collection rates are, how, what the quality of each payer is. In this case, we've got Wiley Coyote Insurance. They're an awesome payer. They, we bill them $100, they pay 100% of the dollars. And that's kind of like a high level view but there's two years of data in this file. And we're able to look at two years of data, which is hundreds of thousands of transactions, which is really hard to navigate in you know, just Excel. So what we did is we created this solution that gives our leadership a, a, a quickly visible tool to all payers at any given time, every month, whenever they want it, and they could filter by payer you have low. But then we took it one step further. We said, could we take that same data and enhance it and in implement a bunch of other benchmarks or insights from it. So we took that same data, the same, the officers were quote, added more queries, brought in that nice to have data, and we were able for each pair to see how quickly are we billing them within 30 days, how quickly are we collecting dollars, how quickly are we closing, what are their adjustments. And this tool has been invaluable from a leadership perspective to be able to real time look at our payer mix and determine the quality of our revenue. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Zach White. He's going to take you through a little bit more detail from the technical aspect. Zach? Hi, uh, my name is Zach White. I'm an analytics advisor with Quorum CBS. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes here to walk you through a deeper look at just a couple of use cases that we've come up with on our team, um, the challenges that we're facing the business, and how we leverage Alteryx to find solutions to those problems. Uh, I want to emphasize that while these are a couple of specific examples, this is nowhere near representative of everything that even just our team is doing with Alteryx. And I feel like, you know, we've barely scratched the surface of even the capabilities within Alteryx itself. And yet we've been able to really revolutionize the, the revenue cycle um, and, and the, the experience of our organization. Um, really with Alteryx, you know, your creativity and your imagination are your only limitations. So it's, it's a pretty open sandbox environment, and I'll show you as we get into that, that uh, you have a pretty broad array of tools at your disposal that you can use to accomplish a lot of uh, a very wide uh, array of tasks um, that you may be doing in your day-to-day -day processes. So the first uh, tool I'm going to show you here is something called the Clue tool. It's um, our Quorum lookup engine. And this was designed to be a self-service tool for our building and collections teams. Uh, the, the necessity here, the background was that um, when we launched, we were getting a lot of uh, requests from our billing and collections teams for kind of routine data requests. So I have a big list of claims or a big list of patients, and I need to know something about them. Maybe what's the current balance of the claim? Uh, who's the current team assigned? How old is the claim? What's the last note that a collector put on the claim in the system? And these would be very cumbersome for somebody to go look up manually one by one in the system. So they would engage our team to go pull these using SQL and query the database, pull all this information back. 
So uh, we were spending a lot of time getting those requests and fielding them. And we came to the realization that what if we just had a, a canned process that took care of the low hanging fruit here? Maybe we can pick 50 or 60 commonly used fields that we're getting requested for a lot of the time and have an Alteryx workflow handle, you know, 80% of the list. And then we can handle the rest when there's really complicated requests that come in. But at least we could have Alteryx take care of the low hanging fruit and prioritize our own time on more difficult projects. So on the user side of having a tool like this, there's some perks here. So they, they don't need to engage the analytics team anymore. Uh, they don't have to open a request ticket. And let's face it, that's no fun to have to fill out a form and wait for the analytics team to get back to you. Maybe they just don't like us. They, they can do all this on their own. They don't have to use our, our um, request ticket system. They can go do this on their own. Um, again, we have many different systems and databases, and a user may be able to go pick apart data exports from different systems on their side. They may have to put it in Excel and do VLOOKUPs. They may have to put it in Access and merge these things together. Whereas on the Alteryx side, we can package all that for them. We can take many different inputs, static mapping files in Excel or querying databases and merge them all together in one workflow and spit it out back to them. Uh, another perk here is that there's fast turnaround when it's self-service. They can get their answers back almost always within the hour, sometimes within just a few minutes. Whereas if they engaged us, they'd have to fall in line behind our prioritization, maybe other projects we're working on. They may be waiting a week or two to get their answer back. Whereas here, maybe if, if they're working an important project, they can get it back the same day. Uh, another perk is that with Alteryx handling the work for us, a user could run this off hours. Maybe they're online late at night working on a project. If we've already gone home for the day, they don't have to wait until tomorrow uh, for us to come in and run this for them. They can do it on their own. From an analytics side, uh, we have perks that, that we're getting out of this too. So there's the conformity of results is a pretty important one. So sometimes there's just low hanging fruit where they want to pull claim balances and that's pretty straightforward. But if, if there's complex pulls and parsing of things out of the system, um, it, it's difficult to have that done the same way every time if we're creating something from scratch every time we get a request. There's the element of human error. Whereas with an Alteryx workflow, we build it once, we set it and forget it, and it's gonna run the same way every time. So we just get it right once and we reduce that uh, risk of having something, some mistake be made the next time we build it. Um, and again, that helps us reduce time that we're writing code from scratch every time. So we are able to monitor the usage of this tool so far and uh, by using Alteryx, um, which you'll see I've, I've exported the usage statistics and we can tell that it's pretty heavily used. So um, we know that it's been used 6,300 times in the last two years. And by our estimates, if we were to handle those requests manually and they take 30 to 60 minutes each, it's saving our analytics team about one and a half full-time employees. If that's all they did all day was handle these requests, we're freeing that time up for our team to go work other projects. Um, there's, there's obviously other gains to it, but this is the most easily measurable one is uh, we can quantify how much time would we have spent. But we know that this is important to the billing and collections teams as well, because for one, there's, there's heavy user engagement with 166 users, but we also get feedback from them. You know, they, they enjoy having tools like this, again, because it's, it's self-service that empowers them to go do things on their own. So we know that it's helping them solve payer projects if they're working a big batch of denials or if they're following up with a payer about a specific set of claims, they can use this self-service tool to go pull information on their own. So this is just a kind of a 10,000 foot view of the process flow here. So th there's always creative solutions that you can find. And in this case, we have an Alteryx workflow and it's gonna go query our databases, pull this information back, but a user needs to be able to talk to it. They need to say, okay, you're gonna pull these fields, but for what I need to be able to tell this Alteryx workflow, what claims or what patients I want it to pull. And these are probably not highly technical coding users. These are billers and collectors. That's what they specialize in. So how do they communicate with our Alteryx workflow? Um, there actually is an Alteryx gallery, which is built into Alteryx, where you can, it, it has an interface, it's a web interface that users can use. And we could have built that, but we didn't have the gallery at the time. So in this case, I came up with kind of a, a workaround solution. Um, because Alteryx can read Excel files and import Excel files and do them in batches, um, I created a simple Excel interface, just a user form, where somebody can enter a list of patients, a list of claims, 
In this case, I'm allowing them to enter up to 20,000 claims at a time. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big set of claims that they can push through this at once if they're working a big project. And that just drops a simple Excel file into a folder behind the scenes. The user doesn't even realize, right? So my Alteryx workflow is going to go pick up all of the files in that folder and run them all at once behind the scenes so the user doesn't know this. Uh, to them, they, they think they click the button and they get the results back, but really Alteryx is doing all the heavy work. Since the user can't kick off the Alteryx workflow themselves without the gallery that we didn't have at the time, uh, in this case, we have an Alteryx server where we could schedule jobs. So again, pulled another uh, little sleight of hand and we just scheduled this Alteryx workflow to run every 15 minutes. So on a routine basis, it's kicking off and looking for these user submissions of what list of patients or claims do they want to hear back from. And then at the end of the day, I have the Alteryx workflow spit out separate sets of, of, of data files. And I can, I can pick out the users who submitted in each run and split out 10, 20 different output files. And then I can email back to them their individual results. They don't have to go check a file folder. They don't have to, you know, hey, is my file ready yet? It'll come back to them directly in an email, which is, again, good from a user engagement uh, perspective. And that's all done within the Alteryx workflow itself. Uh, another cool thing is that with Alteryx, I can export to Excel files. And so I can take bits of information from the data it's running and drop it out into a usage statistics file. So I, I can tell who's running it, how often, how many claims or patients are they pushing through, how long did it take to run, so I can troubleshoot if something is hung up. So that's also neat to have, and, and we can monitor how is that benefiting our analytics team. So uh, here, I'm just giving you a look under the hood. This is zoomed way out because it's a pretty big workflow. This is, if you were actually designing an Alteryx and building a workflow, this is what it would look like. And this is a pretty large one, so it has 265 tools used, but it's a visual interface. And so that's pretty neat because you can just drag and drop. You can, you can accomplish tasks here even if you don't know how to code any SQL or any other coding, you can do imports and data manipulation, cleansing, outputs, just by dragging and dropping in a visual interface. But there's, there's other perks here. So you can see that, like, I've organized it in a way that I like to do, but it, again, it's very sandboxy. You can do it however you like. You can put things into containers, so things that are working on the same task or like kind things, you can put them in boxes. And you can color code those boxes, which indicates to whoever's using the file, if, if somebody else on the team opens this up and wants to tinker with it or fix something, it's easy to see what is doing what. And if we zoom in down here on just one tiny little section, you can see that we also have the ability to document and annotate within the, the workflow itself. So somebody who may need to come in and modify this or they're just wondering how is it accomplishing this task or what's it doing? Maybe they need to troubleshoot and see that you know, it's pulling this data field in the wrong way. They can come in here and see that whoever built it has added notes and here's what this step's doing and why. So you have the ability to embed documentation directly in here. Um, even the SQL queries are embedded, embedded directly in here. So everything is kind of self-documented if, if you set it up that way. So anybody on the team can take over any other workflow and modify it, own it. Um, it's easily transferable, which helps on the analytics side of things. You, you don't have just black boxes and undocumented processes. Um, so that, that kind of wrapped up that self-service tool. As you see, like the, the primary benefit there was just that it reduced a huge workload on our, on our team as far as answering fairly simple data requests to free us up to do other work. Um, the other use case that I'm going to present to you here is claim statusing. So throughout the revenue cycle, uh, we're trying to get paid on a claim, but it enters many different phases of its life. And those codes are used to tell us how long has it been waiting on something to happen, what's going to happen next, what just happened. And those are typically entered by users by hand. So we were able to use Alteryx to kind of facilitate this process. And um, what I want to show here is that um, Alteryx isn't actually doing the statusing itself, but we've leveraged Alteryx to amplify another a process, another tool that IT already had. So we were able to insert Alteryx into this process and leverage it for a new creative solution. So in this case, the claim statusing solution, that the, the problem that we're addressing is right up front when we bill a payer. So we come and we knock on the payer's door. We send them an electronic transaction, a 276, it's called. 
And we're knocking on their door. We're saying, hey, we've got a bill for you. Our patient was just dispensed these drugs. We'd like to get paid. So they'll re reply to us with another electronic transaction back, and that gets swept into one of our, our databases. Uh, and right up front, they're, they're not necessarily telling us, hey, we're going to pay you or we're denying you. The first thing they may be doing is just saying, okay, we hear you knocking. We're going to open our door. Come on in, and we'll talk, right? But they may just slam the door shut. They may not answer at all. Uh, maybe we didn't dot our I's or cross our T's, and they're just, you know, try again. So come back later. And these are two separate paths that we're going to address in our claim statusing. Uh, because these were previously done by hand and manually, uh, which also introduces the risk that somebody might miss one or interpret something incorrectly. So in this case, as I mentioned, we, we didn't have the ability to have Alteryx just go and open up the system, open up a claim, and push buttons to change statuses. But we collaborated with our IT department, and this may be something that um, you have available at your organization as existing processes or tools that you can insert Alteryx into some kind of process to facilitate it, improve it, make it better. Um, and it turned out that our IT, our IT department had a tool that was already doing uh, bulk status changes. All, all that you had to do was drop a specific file in a specific format into a folder. And Alteryx, Alteryx is great at doing that. It can do that pretty easily. So every night, we've got Alteryx workflows that would read those responses back from the payers and do all the decision making. So it would send things down different paths. We, we determined, okay, uh, the business leaders that we met with told us, here are the codes that are gonna tell you they're, they're letting us in the door. And here are the ones that are telling you, we're rejecting you, you know, try again later. So with Alteryx, we're able to do all that decision-making and drop the, the files that we need into the IT processes. And that way we've, we've used Alteryx to cut out a lot of manual steps in between. Even if it's not necessarily doing everything itself, it's vastly improved the process. Um, and again, with Alteryx, we can create exports of data and usage within it itself. Um, so I have another Alteryx workflow that reads what happens every day so that we can keep an eye on, is this valuable? Are we getting a return on our investment from our analytics team designing all these things? And here we push the data out to a Tableau file. So every day somebody could come in and say, how much uh, automation did we do just for these two simple steps? of the, the claims life cycle. And here you can see that each week, we're doing thousands and thousands of claims just from these two particular little steps along the path of a, a life cycle of the claim. And if, if some biller or collector would have to do these by hand, we've estimated that it would be 50 to 60 actions a person could do a day. So you can see that we're saving dozens of employees. I think that works out to about 20 FBEs that can go do other more productive things than having to spend time clicking buttons and changing statuses and reading these pair responses. So um, that also helps our, our billing and collections team stay within compliance because when we get that rejection notice, the clock starts ticking and, and we have internal compliance arrangements where they need to go work those timely and, and make sure we're turning it around and uh, working with the pair to resolve that. And if we can stamp that status earlier in the process and make sure it gets done immediately when we hear back from the payer, that's gonna improve the overall life cycle. So again, those are just two in-depth examples of solutions that we've created, but our team has designed literally hundreds of workflows to solve vast arrays of different problems, and we're still un unboxing all the things that Alteryx to, can do. So uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Brandon to uh, walk you through some more. Hey, thanks, Zach. Um, I'm going to just quickly recap, you know, our presentation at a high level, the strategic objective alignment and the numbers. So really, you know, we looked at staff work lists. They're now have, nice to have data. They're simple, repeatable. We implemented monitoring tools to enhance the data to develop trending and insights. We unlocked dynamic control of SLAs and integrated them into our different processes. And we were able to help preserve revenue integrity by increasing the visibility um, and, and de developing leadership oversight um, you know, initiatives with that. You know, from some of the numbers perspective, the yeah, unbuilt workload solutions, you know, we said cat, it was 20 hours a day or 400 hours a month we saved the business with limited analytics effort. Um, and the leaders were able to spend more time managing the business versus filtering reports, again, with the, the diversions. We didn't really have in that process. It takes two minutes of analytics effort per day, which is automated through the server, and it helps us preserve our re revenue integrity. The Clue tool 
doesn't really help the business as much as it gives them a safe self-service tool and it gives them quick insights. But from the analytics perspective, we actually are able to re reallocate analytics professionals into other projects and efforts and reduce our ad hoc queue, which is awesome. And then lastly, we're able to do this claim status and tool, Jack just took you to, to actually process 4,000 claims worth of work every week, supplementing our workforce, enhancing them by approximately 20, 20 FTEs. Um, so it's kind of a recap of the benefits. So with that, I want to turn it over to the moderator for questions and answers. Absolutely. Thank you, Brandon, and also Andy and Zach for that great presentation. We have a, about five minutes for Q&A, so please go ahead and submit any questions you have for um, the folks that you heard today in your Q&A box. Brandon, I'll go ahead and jump into this question for you from an audience Thanks. member. They're wondering, have you seen a reduction in payer denials and accounts receivables collections from the analytics and reporting automation? Um, so, very timely question, actually. I, that's actually something we're working on now. Um, the team is actually actively developing that solution. Um, we more recently gained the access we need to all that denial information, and we're starting to build that out. So, I would say not yet, but in process. Thank you. And um, we have another question that has come up from an audience member. They're wondering, how much time will it take for implementing use cases with APA? Is this an accelerator or the effort required to use APA is dependent on the number of use cases identified for develop, developing analytics? Let me take that. So analytic process automation is, uh, you know, is, is how we go to market with the Alteryx platform, right? So it's really the platform versus uh, some of the products uh, in the past. And it has brand new, you know, capabilities that we've released recently, including the analytics sub, as well as the intelligence suite, which offers both auto ML and text mining capabilities. So with those capabilities, yes, you can, you can, you know, accelerate your data science capabilities. You can use AutoML uh, to create models and, and test them, you know, faster. Uh, you can obviously leverage text mining uh, and PDF parsing capabilities, which obviously have very significant uses in a healthcare context. And, and so, of course, yes, depending on which use cases, uh, you know, you use, uh, uh, but one can anticipate that you'll see an acceleration in effort. But let me cite a real world example. Uh, just uh, the last webinar we did was with Blue Cross Blue Shield North Carolina uh, that processes almost claims from 3.8 million members with about 7 million calls and they process about 53 million claims. So leveraging some of these capabilities enable them to reduce their ad hoc requests by 18%, lower their customer wait times from 17 business days to minutes, standardize their claims relevant reporting, and save over $4 million in cost savings in less than 10 months to support their business transformation. So hopefully that gives you an example of what you can anticipate. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, really applicable example there. Um, we have another question for Brandon. Um, an audience member is wondering, have you seen an improvement in compliance with visibility enabled by your analytics and dashboards? Uh, yeah, actually, so um, one of the areas that we look at almost constantly and actually daily is, you know, our over, I, I call it overpayments or payments in excess of what's expected. So um, I think with a lot of healthcare companies, you have, you know, there's, there's rules and regulations regarding overpayments and, and things like that. You know, you have to resolve government claims within so many days, commercial claims within so many days. So we were able to, you know, take that, a lot of that logic that comes out, you know, from like a, you know, recommended perspective from like CMS, and we were able to kind of bake that into our data. So we've got some internal dashboards that literally look for that. Like, is there a scenario where we've, you know, received something and we needed to take an action on it to be in compliance with government regulations? And um, we share those insights with our like audit and compliance teams. And that's actually helped us, you know, give them more comfort that we have kind of our, our processes under control and, and that we're monitoring things accordingly. So yeah, absolutely. We've, we've seen a much more engagement and quality from our like a compliance perspective. Definitely. That's really helpful for understanding. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and we're just at the top of the hour. So Brandon, I'll ask this final question 
view as well. Um, besides improved analyst productivity, have you seen any other benefits from your analytic process automation? Well, let's see. I mean, from an analytics perspective, yeah. I mean, I, I think I would say that because we've automated some of our work, uh, the analysts, you know, have, have been able to spend more time working on core projects or doing some of those bigger initiatives of the business. So I, I think, you know, some of the big, just big benefits is that it frees up your analysts to do more than just just send reports and, and maybe get them involved with process improvement in the business and, you know, almost partnering with leaders to, to build solutions. So, you know, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's, give, it's a new, kind of a new approach to, you know, what it means to, to be an analyst, I think. It's kind of unlocked that for us. Absolutely. Thank you for clarifying that. And thanks to the audience members for those great questions today. I want to extend a thank you to our presenters as well for their excellent presentation and all tricks for sponsoring today's webinar. So please enjoy the rest of your day, and we really look forward to having you join us for future webinars.